morning. This is a talk about online mathematics and assessment prepared for the STEM House group. And myself and DM are uh, co-authors of it. Here's a thought experiment to begin the day. You need a paper and a pen and a watch. During this talk, every time you think of something, or any time you're distracted, write down the time. What you'll see is how often you are distracted and how natural distractions arise and how irresistible they are. Children are the same, but they're even more easily distracted. This is a big problem with online education. Today we're going to talk about uh, the present state of uh, online edu uh, distance education. We're going to talk about the traditional versus facilitator versus distance modes and learning and teaching thereof. We will talk about the technology and what features an internet-based course should have. These sorts of talks are always best when supplied with tips because there's no real theory. So we give some tips for parents and administrators and teachers and we will address the, uh, the problem of whether an online course can work. Distance online education means that it's the end of one size fits all education. Distance can tailor the presentation for the student. The student can tailor the reception of the uh, educational product for their best use. In the present, many full-length college and high school courses exist online. Uh, what about elementary school? There are online courses, but they are fewer in number because there are some special problems for the younger kids. And there's a variety of mass market math courseware available to you. You merely have to uh, use your search engine and you can find it. Evaluating it is, is, uh, can be time consuming, if not expensive. For the modes of distance education or modes of teaching, there's the traditional mode that most of us are familiar with. You are the teacher in the classroom. There's the facilitator mode where you as the teacher are sort of more there in the classroom to help the students learn as they need help. There's the distance mode where you, the teacher, are at your school or in an office or really anywhere and the student is learning at a distance from you. So the class is uh, distributed. And then there's self-study. Self-study courses were very popular at least in the United States around the beginning of the 20th century. That's more than 100 years ago but they were not successful uh, or they had limited success. And there are reasons we could go into on that uh, 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 later. In the traditional classroom or traditional method, the student writes down the material and explains and teaches. Answers questions right there in the classroom and uh, keep in mind uh, uh, when the teacher is in the classroom there is an awful lot of communication between the teacher and the students just through eye contact. The teacher assigns, collects, and grades homework. The teacher keeps the pace of the class going and this is adjusted by this maybe nonverbal feedback uh, from the students. This 
teacher makes grades and uh, gives exams and quizzes, holds office hours, and in fact is actually in the classroom. That's the tradition. In the facilitator mode, the, uh, uh, the teacher answers questions right there in the classroom, does the same on homework gra and grades uh, and exams, basically, keeps the pace, holds offices, uh, holds office hours, and is actually there. The difference between the traditional and this is the facilitator gives a general outline of what the student is to do that day, but does not give presentations, or the presentations are remarkably brief. Facilitator conclusions. Students easily adapt to this sort of uh, uh, web learning. Students become active learners. This is very important in distance ed. Students work uh, together and profitably. Students get to work right away. They don't wait for the teacher to do a presentation. Uh, so that makes distractions uh, less of a problem. Faculty help only those students that need help. The drivers today for tomorrow's classes are many, and I'm sure you have experienced them in your own uh, teaching. There's the changing demographics, it's where the students are, and, and of course, how are you going to reach them? There is also a demand for access of the uh, materials from all over. There are the high costs of delivering instruction. Uh, it involves a, a bricks and mortar of a building, and it involves an actual person um, uh, spending time teaching. There's also uh, the issue of uh, are you teaching to give students degrees or a grade level or are you teaching competencies, which means basically you're teaching the student to be good at something. But, and that's it. There's just that. And there's uh, also the aspect of lifelong learning since uh, we see almost everywhere uh, the nature of jobs uh, does not carry on for centuries anymore. It seems that uh, when a, a, a new technology is invented, it creates jobs which have a limited life until the next technology comes along. And there is also an explosion of knowledge going on uh, that knowledge is increasing by uh, a factor of two every every uh, couple of years. Distance education. It's uh, it, in in uh, what is common uh, with the traditional method is content presentation and tests. What is not common is questions, communication, and attention. So let's explain that a little bit. In distance education, you can still have a classroom if you want to run it that way. It doesn't have to be run that way, where the teacher presents material uh, using cameras and microphones and internet services, and the student, wherever located, is able to listen. Tests can be given in the same way. Uh, we won't get into security problems, but there, there is that. The content is the same. What's not common is how students ask questions and how the communication takes place. Now remember, when the teacher is not in the classroom, they do not see the responses of the children or the students. And so they have to guess. 
this is uh, quite an unexplored aspect of uh, distance education. It's this this communication problem between the teachers and the students. And in in the more general distance education uh, formats, where there is no teacher giving a presentation, all of these problems have to be anticipated when materials are designed and developed. And also, it's difficult to gain the attention of students. Suppose I'm giving a presentation and somebody is 100 kilometers away. I have no idea if they're listening to me or not. They may be distracted, but when they're in the classroom, at least you can keep some order. In distance education, uh, the teacher assigns and collects and grades the homework, keeps the pace, makes the grades and exams. Uh, and in this case, uh, there's often trial tests, there's multiple practice tests, there's, and then there's uh, preparation for possible contests. And in addition, holds virtual office hours. This is where the student can communicate by uh, video through a service such as uh, WebEx, Skype, uh, or, or by, well, Skype is like telephone, uh, or by, uh, let's say, say, WebEx any of those services such also Facebook has a similar service to wait uh, to, to WebEx so here are some tips for uh, teachers tips of, there'll be lots of tips in this talk and so this is tips one think of your class as a as a bunch of little light bulbs going on and off you want them all on when you teach so that means it's important to synchronize your class. The attention span for even adults is at most 15 minutes and for children it's maybe 10 minutes. So take advantage of that time span and don't for example wax on for a half an hour or 20 minutes. What, you, what happens is those little light bulbs will be turning off after just 10 minutes. Some of them will stay on for a little bit, some will go off, but once they're off, they're missing what you say. So get their attention, synchronize them, do something for 10 minutes, then take a break and give them something else to do. Uh, tell a joke, show a picture. This resynchronizes the class and then you go on. The best teachers you've ever had do something like this. They'll talk to you for a bit of time and then they'll take a break. Get the class resynced and then they go on with the next part. Now in a, a snapshot we can look at what the uh, uh, traditional instructor, the facilitator, and the distance instructor do in the following sense. Uh, explains material. Uh, the traditional is the only one that does that. Uh, there are explanatory uh, 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 videos and like for the others. For the facilitator, it's mostly materials with often very, very short presentations. The, uh, the teacher answers questions, and so does the facilitator, but in the distance uh, 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 format, Questions have to come through another means. It's often that the student cannot ask questions uh, immediately. It's often done after the fact. They all assign uh, and collect homework. Uh, the first two keep the pace, but in distance it's not clear. It, that's a design decision by the instructor. Are you going to have the students march through the material one day, then the next day, and so forth? Or are you going to let the student study the material and each one go at a different pace? 
or a pace that is compatible with their learning. That's one of the aspects of distance education that was always uh, bragged as uh, possible. Uh, but if there are going to be exams, a certain amount of material must be covered at up to a certain amount of time. So while there can be flexibility, interday flexibility, there has to be uh, maybe a more, more rigid interweek uh, situation format. All make the grades, uh, the exams, and grade them. All hold office hours, and we've discussed that can mean different things. And only for the first two is there somebody actually there, a person. This is a very important thing and should not be diminished. What is the changing role of students? In the distance format, the student can proceed at their own pace. And this is very good. Uh, if the student has a chance to listen to the presentation a second time, or uh, maybe backspace or move back uh, a few minutes and hear the same thing again. This can be very, very helpful for students. Students will have a personal learning agenda, but this has to be created with, uh, with the parent or with the teacher uh, assisting. Students become active learners, which means if the student is distracted and doing nothing, then there is no learning. Whereas if a student goes to a, uh, a school and sits in a class and the teacher presents, even if the student is not even aware or attentive, reading a book or writing a note to a girlfriend or boyfriend, uh, they are not learning, but they're given credit for learning. So in this situation, in the distance education, the students, when they are learning, they're active about it. Students will have a person uh, will have a personal responsibility uh, skills sooner. And let me uh, point out to you that personal responsibility skills are extremely important for success, uh, not only in distance education but all education, actually in life. The changing role of teachers: there be fewer formal presentations, namely lectures. High school teachers especially love to give lectures, and college professors do it all the time. This is a lecture. There will be an expanded role in one-on-one -on -one teaching in the, in the uh, uh, distance uh, genre, and uh, this is because many teachers will have to work with an individual student through some communication process, whether that be email or uh, by phone. A lot of it's one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, there's a diminished role in training. Uh, between the student and the teacher, there's a more cooperative and less contentious um, arrangement. Both are trying to help the process as opposed to in the classroom, sometimes it's the students against the teacher, or it can appear to be that way. OK, and here's a typical module that you, you, you might look at. And uh, this is for distance. Uh, there's uh, uh, going here, starting at the top and going counterclockwise. We have links to projects, links to information, links to prerequisites, then there are videos. This is where the, the similarity to the actual presentation is found. There's online self-tests, there's narrations, animations. Uh, but remember, animations, they take time to generate. They're, they're not automatic, uh, and also some skills. Uh, illustrations and examples and text. Those are all the components of a, uh, a distance learning module. Questions to the teacher. Are your students brilliant or just average? 
uh, in most cases the students are average actually statistically they're average do you have a clear plan for each lesson uh, can you take uh, this is an important one this third one can you take a student from where they are to the answer now what I see in a lot of um, beginning teachers is they can always solve the problem say it's a math problem if they can start and then finish but the more experienced teacher can see what the student has done find some value there and then proceed from that to the solution this makes the student feel better that they've actually contributed uh, and, and it's important to be able to do it it's really a test of mathematical ability are your students prepared to ask questions and actually are they willing to ask questions or are they intimidated they should feel free to ask questions uh, Now finally, uh, and this is the important thing for the uh, distance teaching, can you see the eyes and body language of the students? This is, in, this is immeasurably important and has been since the first teachers and students assembled thousands of years ago. And the answer is no. And so what you have to do is somehow um, get a concept of if the students are learning and often it is good to give a, a little one question quiz during uh, during the presentation the student uh, this also arranges that the student must be at the computer and they can't be go off polishing their shoes or something so they have to be there and uh, many of these uh, uh, technologies for preparing uh, online presentations allow the insertion of little tests right during the course of the uh, the online presentation and I, ad I advise you to consider that and hope that you choose software in which you can do that questions uh, to parents now, parents have to be part of this equation, especially if you're going to have youngsters taking distance education. Uh, and I asked, I asked the parents these questions. Do you think distance learning is automatic? And the answer is it's, it's not automatic. It is, it is a difficult way to learn. It's far more difficult than in the classroom. Are you there to help them learn? That is, uh, are you patient enough to be with, this, with your... Uh, son or daughter with your student and to help them uh, stay on task during the lessons are you there to keep them on track can you feel do you know if your student is learning and are you personally in touch with the teacher can you see what your uh, student is having trouble with and can you help the student uh, uh, communicate with the teacher these are these are tasks for parents so when you're going to teach youngsters little ones by distance there still has to be a lot of human contact can you see if they're engaged in the learning process or are they just staring at the screen for example Here's tips, page number two for teachers. When you do your presentation or you make your video or however you're going to uh, do it, use short sentences. Use consistent notation. Uh, use clarity. Uh, when you present something, uh, assume little, but not too little. Avoid making aside remarks, uh, just off off the cuff remarks that are not relevant to what you're what you're saying, and use relevant examples, examples that'll mean something to the student. 
not abstract examples. Students, I mean, you and I can pick up abstract ideas, but even for us, it takes some time. And it's difficult for little kids to do it that are trying to learn a lesson. So I say there in red, I say less is more. Tips three for teachers. Use some repetition as you work through examples. Now remember, in the classroom, you often have several blackboards. And you go from one to the next to the next, but the material is still there. But in the online setting, the student sees only one screen. So they have trouble remembering what was on the previous screen. So you have to use a little repetition to help, to help that problem. So uh, some repetition and review is uh, continuous review is important. Uh, take questions, but give full explanations. Remember, if one student asks a question, it's very likely that many of them will have a, the same or a similar question. But beware of the frequent questioner. Sometimes they can dominate the classroom. So you have, you have to, uh, you already know that, I'm sure. Options. And they, there are many. And as you start teaching online, depending on the grade level, you'll find out which options that you might choose to use or even uh, new ones. Allow students to progress at their own pace, but in a directed fashion. So this is, a, a, we mentioned this earlier. Uh, encourage the student, uh, the brighter students to move on ahead. And for that, you might need an alternative curriculum. So in the distance education, if you have an especially bright ch child have in your background something else for them to do so they're not bored uh, while you teach the other students. This now is not easy to do in a regular classroom uh, because everybody's right there. But on the distance, you can have alternatives for the very bright students because always you have to teach to the average student. And also, uh, this alleviates self-confidence problems for slower learners. They don't feel like the only reason we're going at this pace is because you know they don't feel smart. It's very important for students to have a certain level of self-confidence. It helps you learn. It helps you uh, do do better. Uh, allow students missing class to make up all the work without special help. Now here's some rules for administrators and any administrators listening uh, in here, uh, uh, please consider these. Allow the teachers to adjust with minimal retraining. Distance education will be new to most and when you're teaching students uh, at the lower grades, many of the teachers simply love children and that's one of the reasons they became a teacher because they love children. They love to be with them. Obey the 20% rule. What's that mean? If, if teaching a distance or your vision of teaching distance requires them to do 20% more work, it'll probably fail. So that's the 20% rule. If you're going to add duties, don't add more than 20% onto what they already do. Take the instructor out of the, uh, uh, out of the teacher as punisher role. The teacher is online but also facilitates and is a helper of students. Allow, it, uh, it, allow the teacher to focus on the most needed problems and they will vary. Uh, as you know, in teaching a class, there are all sorts of problems that need to be considered. More tips for administrators. Uh, teaching online can be very difficult, even with experience. And as I uh, said earlier, uh, uh, teaching is a profession where the teacher loves to communicate with students and loves to help them learn. 
This is why many people become teachers. And when it's in the online mode or the distance mode, part of that is lost. Select great communicators, people that really know how to explain well using short sentences, using uh, also a lot of consistency in language. In the beginning, uh, when uh, teachers are first learning this, reduce their load a little bit because it does take quite a bit of time to, uh, to get good at it. And other, uh, if you make them go too fast, they won't want to do it because, it, uh, uh, because of factors I mentioned. Assure online duties go to excellent teachers. Uh, as in I say there, uh, imagine yourself trying to teach geometry in the dark. This is sort of an analogy of what happens when you're trying to teach at a distance because you don't have that immediacy of the classroom, this communication that uh, is so important. In technology, there's, there's many types. Uh, there's audio and video streaming that I'm sure you will use. Uh, there's e-homework packages available. Uh, th these are learning management systems. Uh, you can prepare supplementary CDs or DVDs with video. Uh, of course, there's you know there's production issues there, and then transmission issues. Uh, uh, use superior channels for helping the students. Uh, support services for faculty. Make sure they have enough materials. Make sure they have a very good high quality computer and make sure they have some training in communicating online. Okay. A, a teacher generally doesn't know how to do this unless they get some training. Training is important. And make videos of all your presentations and the uh, tool I'm using for this presentation is, a, uh, is Camtasia. It links directly to PowerPoint, and I just have to say, record the session, and uh, while I'm talking along showing the PowerPoint, Camtasia is recording everything I say. Here's some key technologies. Uh, think of using cognitive branching tutorials. <laughs> Basically, what that means is that your tutorial will understand or interpret that the student is doing well and you can push them through to the end quicker. Whereas if the student's not doing well, it might give more repeated examples until they uh, demonstrate competency. These are difficult to build. It takes a lot of design work. Uh, there's timed feedback quizzes. You need to give these quizzes so that you can at least see how collectively the students are doing. There's interactive animations and once again these uh, are animations that go on a screen and the student inputs something from the computer and then the interactive animation will uh, give a response. There's the wireless classroom. Um, this is something you might use right at the school and uh, you could even try doing distance education right at the school where the teacher's not in the classroom but the students are learning at a distance and uh, that's sort of a, a semi-facilitator type. Uh, make sure that whatever you uh, produce is what, uh, what I'm calling uh, student error proof. That is the student cannot enter wrong numbers and weird things happen. Every possible response of the student has to be considered and a decision made on what to do with it. So if you're asking for a number and the student enters a letter, your interactive application will have to say please enter a number or something like that. You need continuous student performance and monitoring. 
Uh, Cross-course student tracking with feedback is important if you can manage to do it. That's adding another layer of administration to it. And uh, so uh, maybe not do that right away. And then uh, you can also, uh, using these time feedback quizzes, you can uh, uh, you can get a handle on uh, student uh, prediction, uh, prediction of how they'll do. This has become a very big thing in the U.S. is to use, uh, and DM can address this uh, uh, to you, is how to use, uh, for example, placement exams as predictors of su success. Teachers need uh, even more skills. They need to know many technologies, including computer graphics, animations, calculators, and video. Uh, they need to know pretty well how students, uh, well, children learn with technology. And this is basically a research subject, but there are some literature there. And uh, they need to know the potential and application of online assessment. Uh, particularly, they, they need to become aware of uh, cheating, which of course means the possibility of proctoring, online or distance proctoring. There's methods for this that have been uh, uh, explored and some are effective. But cheating, whenever there's some stakes involved, cheating is a possibility, even for youngsters. Uh, the, they should also know the value of computer games. This is rather new. It's actually been new for 20 years or more uh, uh, as people have figured out how to use a game environment to help students learn. It's difficult uh, to write this sort of uh, material. You have to really be a, a, a programmer to, to do that sort of thing. Now for summer math contests uh, online, um, it, they're good for finding your very best students. It, it's very good for determining uh, who's good at science, technology, engineering, and math. It's a good introduction to international tests, and it can lead to international scholarships. Now I uh, sent under a separate cover uh, with I DM to uh, sort of a blueprint of getting a test organized. Uh, that was a, just sort of a sketch. There are many aspects. I did look at the uh, Math Olympiad out of Singapore. And uh, let me add, uh, mention to you the questions that I looked at. They have sample questions are very nicely done. And it a teacher can't just sit down and write those questions up. The teacher has to be sort of on the hunt for questions all the time, and then they occur from time to time. So you need a team of people to write those type of questions. But you notice that all the answers were integers. And if all the answers are integers, it can be machine graded, and that's important. So that can also be done online. So, uh, uh, more tips for administrators. Know the uh, efficacy of course management systems, and you'll probably want to adopt one. Uh, there is the based, uh, there's commercial systems, but there's some open source such as Moodle and Canvas, and DM has uh, great experience with them and could set you up. Uh, but as always, uh, writing the questions is, is, takes a lot of time. Know what technology is important and what is just expensive. Don't spend too much money or don't buy an expensive piece of equipment. Dang, the telephone ring. Uh, uh, don't spend uh, uh, money on equipment that's expensive unless you really know what you're going to do with it. Know your faculty and have always a technology advisor with some experience. This is very helpful. Learn the jargon. Competency management system. 
And in the uh, version of the talk which you have access to, these are all links. Uh, Competency-based management, digital content creation, educational technology, otherwise known as e-learning, intelligent tutoring systems. These are difficult to construct. I, I can promise you that and maybe would come at the third stage of your program when everything else is working fine. Uh, learn about learning objects. Uh, uh, get a list of learning management systems to decide what you're going to use, which one you're going to use, and what you're going to use them for. Don't start too ambitious. It's start basic. Uh, student information systems. What is the, what are those? Uh, and a virtual learning environment. Well, that's really what we've been talking about the whole the whole presentation here. Every effort should be made to judge course, course efficacy and one way to do that is to look at the graduates of one class and see how they do in the next class in comparison with uh, your test group which might be students taught in the uh, original method, the traditional method. So this should be part of the design of how you're going to measure how well you did. Teachers need to commit to the process and they must be given time to learn how to teach online. It's, it's quite a bit different. The cost of success can be high uh, both in money and time. And here is, here is uh, uh, some examples. Blackboard is a commercial system, but it's very expensive. XYZ Solutions is a newer company, and you may be able to get them to work with you at a low cost to develop. What they do is develop uh, what are called algorithmic problems. And uh, this means that every student sees a different problem, but all the problems of a certain set are very similar. So this avoids cheating. And Moodle and Canvas, uh, that's those, those percentages are how much of the open market uses, uh, uses these systems. Can the online course work? And the answer is yes. But you have to check all the boxes. It has to be well planned. You need great teachers. Uh, and actually, don't pick teachers if they think it's uh, going to be reduced work. It's not. If they t treat it as reduced work, uh, it, they'll have reduced success. Uh, th they need to uh, use intelligent systems and course management. And uh, the students have to be willing uh, to learn this way. If they don't want, some students really want a teacher. We've discovered that. And when we've had online things, courses, if the student didn't like the online, we would immediately put them into a traditional class if that was possible. The bottom line is this cannot be done without great teachers. So that's the end of the talk. I'm I'm happy to answer questions, uh, but in this case, you'll have to send them by email. So have a good day, and I uh, hope to talk to you again uh, soon.